Hi everyone, welcome to Oxford and the maths department, which is the home to loads and loads of mathematicians. Uh, I'm Melanie Opflin, I work here in geometric analysis, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introductory talk and maybe also just encourage you to think up some questions to then take and go outside to talk with the people of the different research groups about PhDs. So let me just start off with a very basic question of why do we want to do a doctorate? Or maybe actually let me start at the end and start with where can a doctorate lead? So of course, some of you are interested in doing a doctorate because you are thinking of doing an academic career afterwards. And doing a doctorate is really the first step to, be to become basically a researcher. So you can think of it as a little bit as an apprentice of becoming a mathematical, apprenticeship of becoming a mathematical researcher. But this doesn't mean that everyone who does a PhD will go on into the world of academia or that everything that you learn during a PhD is only useful in academia. So there's lots of places to go after a, a PhD. Of course, as I said, academic life or higher education is one of them, but we have PhD students going into banking, industry, research, teaching, basically everything. So we just want to basically say that if you are doing a PhD, you're not committing yourself yet to a particular path in life, but you're taking a first step and that might lead to an academic career, but that might just as well lead to somewhere else. And I think that's okay um, to do. Now, one of the things, again, doing a PhD, you're not just learning about academic life, but you're learning lots and lots of skills. And these are also skills that other employers like. So they like that during a PhD, you really have to become independent. You have to be resilient of dealing with the same problem day in, day out, and usually things just going wrong most of the time and then succeeding sometimes. And I think that is really building a lot of good life skills. And so if you are doing a PhD, you learn things, you're becoming more mature or more autonomous. You're actually questioning a lot of things. So these are things which are useful in life, whether it's in academia, in industry, in real life. So yeah, okay. Now, of course, you are here because you're considering the question, not just is it worth for anyone to do a PhD, but really is it worth for me? Is it the right thing for me to do a PhD? And maybe where should I do my PhD? And who should I do my PhD with? So first of all, if you just ask yourself, well, is it a good idea? What's the most important thing to do a PhD? Well, really, you should love the subject and you should basically want to go off and do more math. That's the main motivation of doing a PhD. And I'm really say, talking here about doing math, not just learning about math. So, of course, you will have to read papers, you will have to attend some lectures, you're going to seminars, research talks, and you learn a lot about what other people do in mathematics. But the big difference to a degree is you're actually going off and doing it yourself. And for me personally, that was the reason I wanted to do a PhD. I just had so much fun proving stuff during my masters that I just wanted to continue proving more stuff. And that led me to doing a PhD. Now, at the same time, I think, Doing a PhD, you're not losing anything, so you're not closing up your options for later, but you're learning a lot of things, and it will lead you to other possibilities for your future career, either in academia or outside academia, and it gives you a way of broadening your horizon, learning new skills. And I think here it's also important to say this is not just if you go to the applied side of mathematics, where you see more immediately the skills that you learn by coding and so on, but also PhDs in pure mathematics, even if you do not do so much of the sort of practical things that employers might look for, you're going to learn a lot of other, have another transferable skills. And in some sense, it's also helping you grow as a person. So in some sense, struggling with a problem for months and months and finally getting the stupid thing solved is just great. And it really helps you and it, it teaches you that there are things in life which you might find difficult, but you can actually overcome them most of the time. Sometimes it takes months, sometimes it takes years. I'm currently working on a project that I first thought about 12 years ago and it's finally making progress. 
but that's okay. Right, so one of the things which let's just all agree, doing math is fun, but doing math can also be frustrating if stuff doesn't work. And just a fact in life is if you do a PhD, most of the time things will not work, but, or you will not see that what you're doing actually leads towards the solution. But you make very, very small steps, then a proof dies again, and you go back and you start something new. So you have to have motivation and some resilience, and you have to be okay with spending time on the same project for months at a time. But you don't have to do it alone. So I think one of the things is that you're, you're not on your own with your problem. There are always people around you, or at least you should make sure that where you do your PhD, there's people around you who you can talk with. There will be some people in a very close circle who actually understand what you're doing. That will be your supervisor, maybe some PhD students working with the same supervisor in the same group. But there is going to be a lot more people who are in the same boat of my proof doesn't work, my code breaks down and my computer crashes all of the time, who might not understand your specific problem. But you can talk with them and you can discuss common problems that you have. Sometimes even just explaining to someone what the problem is can really help you work out what you're doing because you have to clarify everything. So you need independence, you need responsibility, you need resilience, and you just also, just you need to have fun doing mathematics. I think that's the most important thing. Now, if you've decided PhD is what I want to do, and I guess quite a lot of you, this is what you have decided, and that's why you're here, then comes the more practical part of where do I want to do a PhD and who do I want to do a PhD with? And here really the first thing to talk yourself to talk about yourself is what's my motivation? Why do I want to do it? And do I understand what research involves? Do I understand what it means to just do math and not just learn about math? If you answer that positively, then PhD might be really something for you. Also, if you're unsure about that, because you might never have spent a few months thinking about the project, I think most of you will not have done that, that's okay, but it's the sort of the smaller things of do I enjoy really, you know, struggling with a, with a problem from a problem sheet? And am I happy if, you know, I just can't get it done, but finally I get through it? So that, that's a good indication that we, you will like doing a PhD. And now if, you, if you're unsure about it, really talk with students who currently go through sort of the, their first stages of a PhD, or people who have just done the PhD, have finished, to find out a little bit more about this. Okay, then one of the important things, and that really will also decide of how much you will enjoy doing a PhD, is get the right subject area for yourself. Find out what am I really interested in. Not necessarily which area has the fanciest theorems or fanciest questions out there, but for what area do I think I will enjoy getting my hands dirty and do it? So do you enjoy proving things by you know, estimating things like that? Do you enjoy coding? Do you enjoy the very abstract thinking and trying to see, yeah, you're trying to, to, to find common patterns in there? So you will know a lot from undergraduates about what is out there in mathematics. You will have felt that for certain subjects, you really enjoyed the problem sheets. For others, you really liked the lecture, but really didn't like solving the problem sheets. That is a good indication of where, in some sense, your interests might lie. Then don't be influenced about, of course, a lecturer can influence how much you enjoy a lecture. Don't be influenced by that. So both in the positive way and also if you didn't like the lecture, that doesn't mean you will not enjoy the corresponding subject. It might not be that you want to do a PhD with a lecturer you don't like, but maybe the subject is still for you. And also keep an open mind. So often, at undergraduates, the sort of the syllabus is, you know, it's the things that have been done quite a few years back. And a subject evolves from that. And so try to find out what is it really like doing research in that particular field today? What does it involve? Look at some recent, for example, papers, ask, look at what the supervisor that you have in mind has been doing and find out whether that type of mathematics is something for you. 
Okay, then there's another thing to decide if you're more interested in the more applied subjects, whether you would prefer to have a more project-based research working possibly with an industry partner. Again, this is something I cannot say much about because I'm working in pure mathematics, but if you're interested in this, these are questions you should ask outside where you will see the research groups of how does that work? Is that a possibility? What are the advantages of it? And so on. And then comes the dreaded question of how do I find the right supervisor for myself? So first of all, what you're interested in decides of who do you even look at as potential supervisor. So you want a supervisor who's interested in the type of things you're interested in, or at least in the type of sort of mathematical, you know, sort of doing math that, that you want to do. And then you want to find out a little bit about them, about their research. So there's loads of resources out there. Since the pandemic, even more, everyone that has been giving a talk in the last three years will probably have a talk on YouTube somewhere. You can actually see people talk about their research and that gives you a bit of an insight. You can look at their papers on archive. You can look at their home pages and, and see what they've been up to. And you can chat with people. Feel free to also approach a supervisor. And of course, here in particular, the whole point of this open day is also getting you in touch and allowing you to chat with people. So there will be the stands outside of each of the research groups. And then you might go to a particular research group and then there's the person there you're not interested in talking with because they might work in a particular area of the field that you're not interested in. Just ask them whether so-and-so will also come some of us will be there for half an hour, for an hour. So if you find out when the relevant person is around, you can chat with them. And then also to get an honest opinion of what it's like doing a PhD with a supervisor, chat with the students, that's also helpful. Find out how does it work? How are the dynamics in a group? Are students chatting a lot with each other? Does it fit with your style? of what you expect of a PhD. Not every PhD student wants the same level of supervision. Some people are very happy to just be able to go off for a few weeks and solve something and don't like having to come every week back to the supervisor and say what they've been doing. Others really would like to meet more often, would like to collaborate together with the supervisor. So these are questions you can just ask how it is. Then. Choosing the supervisor is really the first thing in some sense what you do, but of course you're not just going to talk with the supervisor, hopefully, during a PhD, that would be pretty lonely. But the good thing is you, you are actually at an institution and you want to talk with people at the institution, you want to profit from what else is going on out there. So you want to ask is where do I go, want to go and is it for the right reasons? And it's not about the nightlife so much or I don't know what else, it's really about is the, the place mathematically the right thing for me? And are there supervisors there who I can see myself working with? Then just as importantly is, are there young people around who I can chat with? Are there other PhD students, both in the wider department and in particular in your research group? So these people that you can share frustration with and who will not run away scared, uh, scared if you tell them something about, in my case, a partial differential equation, and who will be happy enough to just chat with you about sort of the wider topic. And are PhD students doing things together? So is there an active sort of research community and some other activities going on? What kind of research is done at the institution and also do you have a chance of taking part in seminars? So seminars give you a sort of a view towards the wider research community and a really good, you, you're going to spend most of your day as a PhD student in a little corner of mathematics where you're going to try to sort out your own problem, but then you still want to have a bigger view for both of your research field and also of what else is out there, what other techniques are people using, what other questions are they interested in. So having seminars is great. Some final advice is yes, find a good supervisor, that's really important. Find a place where you feel like you belong to and keep an open mind and also really trust the advice of people who have been there and done that. Then of course we are in Oxford, so why Oxford? Now, why Oxford? 
First of all, there's loads and loads of mathematicians out here and we like chatting about everything. And there's really good maths going on here. So we are having this big common room, which the picture is in some sense wrong. You hardly ever see it empty. So usually there's lots of people in the common room. Some of them will be doing mathematics, others will be eating pizza, but both of them are important because you will find people who are happy to chat about mathematics, about something else, and you're just involved in a big community. So there's, a, of course, a very long track record with lots of famous names, and I don't need to go at all into that because in some sense you care about what's happening now more than what happened 800 years ago. So now at the moment, I guess we, it's fair to say that most of the areas of mathematics you can learn about, you can do a PhD here in Oxford. And that also means that if you work in a particular field and suddenly it turns out, oh, I need to learn more about geometry, I need to learn more about stochastics and so on, there's going to be people there who do that. And there's going to be PhD students there who do that, who will be in particular very happy to finally explain to someone who understands less about the subject than them of what the basics are. We're also, because we are, we are a very large department, there's regularly international conferences that are hosted here. There's far too many seminars here that you could all go to. So I think someone counted it up. There's over a thousand departmental seminars a year. So you're not going to all of them, but most research, or all research groups have weekly seminars and then you can pick and choose from other seminars to learn about other topics. And there's also special talks and there's just a lot of mathematics going on without you even having to leave. Which doesn't say that you shouldn't attend conferences during your PhD, but it's sort of a cheap way of getting a lot of the benefits from the conferences already. And then you can still travel to conferences more in your sort of particular subject area of finding out more. So that's in some sense, size can matter if it comes to a department because it gives you more people to talk with, it gives you more things that you can see. And we're really big here. So we have over 350 PhD students. So you will find some people to talk with. You probably find people who do the same sport, to do the same, I don't know, have other interests. And so there's over 1,600 mathematicians in the department. So just there's a lot of people. But that shouldn't scare you. That should be a, a positive thing. It's also the postgraduate community here is really active. So I've already mentioned pizza before. There's something which is called the North meets South colloquium, where people from pure math explain in simple terms of what they do so that all mathematicians can explain, uh, understand it. The same from applied math. And then you have a mixed colloquium about it. And then you go off and eat pizza together. There's something called Fridays at four, which is sort of regular events about other things you might need to know if you do a PhD whether it's about academic careers, whether it's about how do I, what should I do when I go to my first conference to things like mental health and so on. And all of this is usually followed by happy hour in the common room so that you actually get chatting with people. There's also lots of student-led activities. You have student-led seminars and working groups. Some of them explicitly say, please no faculty here. We don't want you here because we want to chat informally and admit that we really don't understand that particular part and so on. And there's also, of course, teaching opportunities contributing to the undergraduate teaching. Now, one of the things that Oxford is a bit different and that might, for people who are from outside Oxford, at first, thing, at first glance look quite weird is that you're not just a member of a department, but you will also be a member of the college. And that just gives you, in some sense, more people to connect with and also nicely, it's, it's very, very nice to meet mathematicians, but it's also very nice to meet non-mathematicians. So in college, you have people from all areas coming together for a lot of, there's a lot of social activities happening in the colleges. There's also some more academic activities with cross-disciplinary talks and so on. So it gives you another place to call home. Now, in practice, don't stress yourself out too much about which college to put down on the application. The one thing I would look out for is think about accommodation because that's a big thing that colleges bring. And many colleges offer accommodations for the first year. Of course, you have to pay for it, but you can get accommodation that way. There are some colleges who also offer accommodations for all years, if that's what you want. So think about what you want, how you want to live before you do your college application. 
But other than that, don't stress about it too much and just see there's another way of connecting with people. So in short, doing a PhD is frustrating, but also really fun. And while you do a lot of things on your own, you're not alone in that. And actually having a good community around you is going to make a big difference to your life. So I think with that, I'm at the end of my bit. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rhiannon. I'm a second year DPhil student in algebra. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about my experience doing a gap year after my undergrad. So I did my undergrad at Oxford, took a year out and started my DPhil, um, and also talk about things I'm involved in, in the department. Um, so I guess like, if there's quite a lot of misconceptions about doing gap years after your PhDs, um, this idea that you'll get really rusty. Um, I don't know, I mean, like, I don't think you'll lose that much maths, personally. Um, it really depends on which subject area you do as well. But in my experience, lots of people here have taken years out. Some of them might have had done, like, worked in like, finance jobs for four years and then gone to a PhD. So doing a PhD at any age is very accessible. Um, so in my gut view, I worked as a maths teacher for a year. Um, in a secondary school, I also did a bit of research on the side, kept in contact with my master's supervisor, etc. Um, I felt quite confident doing that. I knew that I needed it for my kind of a little break after my undergrad, which just, I felt was quite intense. Um, and I talked to my now supervisor at the end, beginning of my fourth year, and he really supported me with that decision. Um, if you do want to talk to me about doing a gap year, please do afterwards. Uh, so I started my PhD last year, and um, my day-to-day -day life consists of lots of, kind of struggling with algebra, learning bits of geometry, topology. Um, I think I'm quite interdisciplinary in what I do. I work in kind of derived, um, a new approach to derived analytic geometry. So I incorporate lots of ideas from topology, algebra, and geometry in my research. Um, on top of that, I also do teaching. So rather than teaching 12-year-olds, I now teach first years. Um, <laughs> but similar in some ways, different in others. Um, and so I really enjoy that experience. It makes me feel really connected with my college as well. Um, and it's also just good to have a bit of boost to your like, finances. Um, so most like deep PhD programs include some teaching requirement. Um, and I definitely would embrace that. It's a really good opportunity to feel good in your abilities in maths, um, as well as kind of get involved in the department and meet younger students. Uh, so apart, aside from teaching, I also run uh, Mathematrix, which is the um, a student-led discussion group for minorities in maths. So we run lots of um, events talking about um, like things from harassment to um, careers. And we also do lots of um, events such as we did a women's only formal a couple of weeks ago. So it's a good chance for people who might not feel that included in the department to come together and talk about their experiences. And the department is really, really good about these things. And there's loads of inclusion and diversity initiatives throughout the department. Um, so if there's, that's something you're interested in, there's definitely places you can go for that. I think that's all I want to talk about. Hi, Al. Um, so um, I'm, my name's Adele. I'm in my fourth year of a DPhil in the topology group, so I'm also in pure maths. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what, a day in the, like, what a day or a week in the life of a PhD student actually looks like here. Because um, I know I had no idea when I started, honestly, what I was in for. Um, so this varies over the degree, but um, in your first year, um, you'll hear at least you'll, there are some coursework requirements that you do some broadening that's sort of outside your main research area. And you'll likely also be doing um, some teaching, which is mostly marking at first, um, but then later on there are opportunities to um, teach like some of these um, first and second year tutorials, which are two students and you. Um, for an hour normally, or some of the later year classes, which are more like 15 people. Um, you also have regular meetings with, with your supervisor, um, hopefully, though that frequency varies, um, and maybe two to three seminars a week. 
some number. Um, yeah. And um, so, yeah, with some of those are junior seminars, which are the sort of run by, generally run by and for DPhil students, and maybe some of those are your research group seminars. Um, and they really are great ways to sort of keep up to date with what's going on in your field. Um, and then there's also um, sort of regular tea and lunch and I guess all the socialization, all, all the social, like the sort of mathematical socializing that the last speaker talked about. Uh, and then around that all, of course, there's research, but um, term is fairly busy. Um, and then outside term, um, pretty much everything just stops. So there's still, you know, the department and, you, and, you know, everything, you know, your office is still there. Um, but it's a great time to really buckle down and get some work done um, and you can, and spend a solid amount of time um, thinking about problems without too much distraction. And also a great time to go to conferences where those are maybe two days to two weeks in um, uh, all over the world and you get to... Um, they're a great opportunity to meet a whole lot of people in your research area, to hear about all sorts of maths that maybe aren't happening at all, like that's maybe different from, what, from what's happening at Oxford, and also to see some fun parts of the world. Um, great. Um, yeah, so, but overall, you really can set your own schedule, um, which is, I think, which, which is, um, I think we're pretty lucky to be able to do, that you can really work in whatever way um, suits you best. Uh, hi guys, I'm a fourth year student in uh, number theory, in the number theory group, and I just wanted to maybe say a few words about the kind of mentality that a uh, DPhil student has uh, when working on these kind of longer term projects as opposed to maybe in undergraduate where you have courses each semester, maybe each week you have a problem sheet that's given to you. Um, so it's really a kind of shift in your attitude and approach to the kind of uh, goals you're working towards and so at least for me uh, I found it very helpful to think about uh, kind of being attuned to kind of the tendencies I had um, the kind of strengths when I for example working at night seems to suit me a lot easier than in the morning when I'm feeling kind of sluggish so you just get a kind of feeling for yourself which you should as a student kind of already have a sense of but really um, being in touch with your kind of psychological uh, abilities and also kind of weaknesses is can be very powerful for being productive in the long term and you know sometimes it can feel really daunting when you're faced with uh, a very a four-year degree or a very long-term goal so it's quite helpful to have shorter term and smaller uh, goals that you can be continually making progress on albeit maybe quite small and at least in my case I found that uh, my motivation, my excitement to be working on mathematics is strongly a function of the recent rate of progress I've had. So think about the first derivative of how much uh, I've been accomplishing maybe in the past day or the past week or the past month. And uh, it really has uh, a strong kind of correlation with how uh, much energy I can give into uh, work uh, going forward. And so for that reason, um, it's very uh, helpful to kind of be, for, for me at least, to, to always have something that I'm making, uh, a kind of range of goals, either big or small, that I'm making progress on continually so that there's a, some sort of positive feedback loop to continually be interested. But at the same time, it's uh, important to kind of have as a, a broad picture that uh, this is a kind of, can be daunting at times, and uh, therefore it's very important to have this kind of, kind of wellspring of, uh, psychological uh, strength that when there are going to be kind of these downtimes and uh, you feel like you're kind of stagnating and not really making any progress, you can really have the kind of mental fortitude to kind of keep pushing and know that maybe uh, in a week or a month down the line you can get back to this uh, mentality where things start to feel like they're progressing really quickly again and then that's really where uh, it becomes exciting and fun again. And you just have to keep that in mind during the, the, the lulls. Hi, I'm Sophie. Um, I think I'm the only applied mathematician here. So I'm in the Occam group, which is um, Oxford Centre for Industrial and Applied Maths. Um, I'm going to talk about CDTs. So these are a different way to do a PhD. Um, it stands for Centre for Doctoral Training, and I'm part of a CDT. Um, so this is... a. Uh, a group, they get funding for five 
cohorts of students and it, they'll take on students in a particular area. So the CDT I'm on is um, all industrial maths and it doesn't exist anymore in the last year, but there's others. Um, and the way it works is that you will do four years and your first year is a little bit like a master's. You do taught courses that are all tailored to your the area of the CDT and then you'll have three years of research. And in the first year, you also usually do two mini projects and you kind of get to test out projects and supervisors. So it's nice, um, you don't have to go in knowing a research project and a supervisor. So the application process is a little bit different. Um, so I think you'll talk about applications for regular DPhils and it's common to contact supervisors in advance and talk about projects. With a CDT, you don't need to do that. They'll have usually a bunch of projects kind of lined up and prospective supervisors and you, um, within the CDT in the first few months, you kind of look at who's available, what projects are available, and yet, yeah, as I said, you do too many projects. And if you don't like them, you can often find a different project or you agree which one you like, and if your supervisor is happy, then you carry that on into your full DPhil project. Um, the funding is also good. All CDD pro CDT places across the country are, are funded. I think all DPhil places at Oxford will also be funded, but it's not the same at other universities. Like you could be offered a DPhil, a PhD place and not offered funding, whereas CDT places will always be funded. Um, the advantages, I think, are that you have another support network. So you have a cohort of students. So I have nine other students that all started at the same time as me. So we have each other. We're all going through the same thing. After the first year, you all go off into your own research groups because we're all doing quite diverse things under the umbrella of industrial maths. And so you also then have your um, research group. You meet other people, but you've also got, you've always got your cohort and the CDT director. So it's another level of support. Um, yeah, as I said, you kind of have ready-made projects. So if you don't really know what you want to do, you know maybe the vague area, but you don't have a supervisor or a project in mind, then it's a good way to like develop that over the first year. Um, if you know what you want to do and you know what supervisor you want to work with, then it's probably not the route for you. Um, there's one of them in the maths department at the moment called Random Systems, and they do kind of stochastic modeling, um, probabilistic things. There's also one called SABS, which isn't in the math department, but a lot of their students come to the math department for their project. So that's, um, SABS stands for Sustainable Approaches to Biomedical Science, I think. So they do their first year outside of the department and then they go off to different departments. Some go to chemistry or biology and a lot of them come here. Um, there is a current bid for new CDT. So in the next two years, I think that might be another bunch, so depending on when you apply, there might be others available. Um, yeah, I think that's everything from me. In this session, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the nuts and bolts of um, your application. So um, there are going to be three of us talking about this. My name's Mark Lackenby. I'm going to start things off by talking, uh, first of all, a little bit about funding and then um, about the process of, of choosing your field of study. Um, and then, um, uh, so I'm one of the directors of graduate studies here in the Maths Institute. And the other director of graduate studies is Peter Howell. Um, and he's going to be talking a little bit about um, what should go into your statement of purpose. Um, and um, then Helen Byrne will be talking about uh, what you can expect in your interview. Um, and then actually we'll close the session off uh, with um, Professor Rama Kant, who will talk specifically about the CDT and random systems that's accepting applicants in the next round. So I want to start things off by talking about funding. So that's often uppermost in applicants' minds um, and for good reason. So our intention is that um, all our graduate students here should have funding. Some will come with their own funding. So some students, for example, applying for, whose, whose country is, is not the UK, some 
governments offer funding, for example, to come to Oxford to, um, uh, to do graduate work. Um, there are other scholarships, international scholarships available, for example, the Rhodes Scholarships. Um, but the majority of our DPhil students are, are funded by sources from Oxford. And um, <clears throat> the good news is, I mean, that the, 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 there are lots of different sources of funding, sources within the department. There are scholarships uh, that the uh, university provides. And the good news is that <clears throat> you will be considered automatically for those when you put your application in. You don't have to make a separate application for funding if that funding is coming from any Oxford source. Um, that said, though, it is worth flagging that there are some specific scholarships, um, some targeted scholarships, um, some of which are, are new this year. So, for example, there's the Pembroke Black Academic Future Scholarship, which is um, for uh, UK students who are black or mixed black, and um, they uh, are fully funded scholarships. Um, there's the Wang Scholarship, which is fully funded, available for any DPhil student. Uh, new is the Charles Coulson Scholarship in Mathematical Physics. That's a fully funded scholarship um, in Mathematical Physics, unsurprisingly. And then there's the Heilbronn Doctoral Partnership Scholarships, which um, uh, also offer fully funded scholarships across a range of areas, as shown there. So all of those scholarships you'll automatically be put forward for if you're eligible. You do not have to make a separate application. Okay, so now I want to go on to talk um, a little bit about uh, choosing your field of study. Um, and this is, this is not an easy process. Um, so when I was at the stage of, your, roughly your stage of applying for a PhD, um, I actually... Uh, was investigating um, potentially doing a PhD in America, and I flew across to, uh, to California. I looked at some of the universities around there. Um, and um, I was very kindly met by one of the directors of graduate studies, and um, he said, so what do you want to study? And I said, maybe topology, maybe combinatorics. And he said to me, you've flown halfway around the world and you can't decide between topology and combinatorics. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure whether to be aggrieved or humiliated, um, but the fact of the matter is that I hadn't decided between the two of those. And I imagine that many of you will be in a similar sort of situation. There'll be many different areas of mathematics that you like and that you might consider doing a PhD in. Um, and that's fine. Um, but nevertheless, it is really important that you do hone in on some specific areas that you want to study. On your application form, you have to put down what areas you want to study. You don't have to give, say, the title of your thesis project. That, that's not expected. But you do need to say something more specific than just pure mathematics. And preferably, so I'm a topologist, you need to say something more specific than just topology. So for example, low dimensional topology, or homotopy theory, or other different sub-branches of topology. And there are multiple reasons for this. One is that um, an unfocused application maybe suggests that you haven't put enough thought into what you want to study. But more importantly, one of the roles of the application is to, one of the roles of, of saying what you want to study is to make sure that your application is directed towards the correct potential supervisors. And if you're too broad, then you won't be, your application will not end up in, on the desks of the, the relevant supervisors. And so um, it's, it's, it's important that you, that you do hone in what, on some relatively specific subject areas. It's perfectly right to give more than one, but you shouldn't just be 
too broad. Now, this is a challenge for you because um, it's, you know, say you want to do topology, which is my area. And you maybe think oh, I might want, might want to do algebraic topology. But at your home university, the algebraic topology course is next term, which is too late. Um, so what you have to do is you have to do your own research to work out what you want to study. And that's quite tricky. So you should be asking yourself, well, what are your interests? Melanie, in her talk at the beginning, um, sort of highlighted this. It's really important that you choose an area that you are interested in. You're going to be studying it for at least three years, probably four years, and maybe more. So it's really important that you choose something that you're genuinely interested in. It's also important that you choose something that you're good at. So as it was in my case, I'm actually quite pleased I chose topology rather than combinatorics because I turn out not to be very good at combinatorics. Um, but it's really important that you look at yourself and say, what am I good at? Because mathematics is difficult and you, you want to be putting your best foot forward. You want to be specializing in an area that you are naturally good at. Um, and then you should start um, to look at what sort of uh, areas there are available. So the Maths Institute has a, a, a web page on um, the different research groups that are in Oxford. And you click on those and you find out who is in the different research groups. And you can see the sort of subjects that they're studying. So you, um, I encourage you to you know, click on people's web pages look at papers they've been writing, maybe even go to Google Scholar and uh, type in that potential supervisor's name and find out what papers they've published recently and you know, how, what they're most, how active they are in terms of, say, citations compared with others. Citations aren't everything, but nevertheless, you want to try to get an indicator of, of what people's best papers are and then read those and think, is this something that I might want to study myself? The problem is that's actually really difficult. You probably read their paper and maybe not be able to get beyond the first page. But you should view this as a sort of as a project that, you know, maybe to understand that paper, I have to read something else. And that will build up, you'll help, help you build up a, a picture of the, the relevant subject area. And you can then decide, start to get a feel for whether that sort of thing is for you. You can talk to people, and talking to people is a good idea. So um, talking to um, the academics at your home institution, um, uh, and so, you know, particularly in areas that you think you might be interested in, talk to them, arrange to chat to them, and say, you know, who would they, who would they recommend that you did a PhD with? Um, and maybe they could give you an overview of the different subject areas. So it's a difficult process, but once you've honed in on a subject and potential supervisors in that subject, it is really important, and this is the one th message that I want you to take from this. It, I, in my view, it's really important that you reach out to those supervisors and say, hi, I'm X. Are you taking students this year? Right? Because there's no point saying I want to work with Professor Mark Lackenby to do low dimensional topology if Professor Mark Lackenby is not taking students this year because I don't know, they're unfortunately director of graduate studies. Um, they, it's, it's, it's really important that they are potentially taking students. You've, you could also maybe, uh, you may be able to ask you know, whether you could have a chat about, about potential research projects. Many academics are very busy so you, you should bear that in mind. But nevertheless, a simple, quick email asking whether people are taking students is something that I would really encourage. Um, it just makes good sense. So my name is Peter Howell. I'm the other Director of Graduate Studies in the department. So I'm going to talk about the uh, Statement of Purpose, which uh, certainly for Oxford is another of the um, things that you have to include in your application. Um, 
And um, I think I'm just going to repeat a lot of the things that Melanie and Mark have already said. So it really, I think, is um, part of the same um, uh, process of demonstrating your commitment to your chosen field of study. Because um, what it does require from you is that you really think about um, what um, areas of mathematics you're most interested in, you're most motivated to work on for three or four years of your life, and where you can really demonstrate um, the potential to do mathematical research. Um, and it requires you really to find out what's going on. What are the um, interesting research areas? What are the um, potential um, sort of research projects you might be working on? Um, and who are the people who are, who are doing research in this area, um, in this university or anywhere else? Um, so that does require, exactly as Mark said, some commitment from you to do your research, find out what's going on and who's doing it in your chosen field of study. Um, you're not expected to have a really detailed plan or timeline for the whole three or four years of exactly what research question you're going to answer or whatever. But I should say it's a few applicants do, um, so it's not completely unheard of for people to really have narrowed it down to that um, sort of level. Um, so I think you should, what you should have done is uh, narrowed down to a particular research topic, maybe two. Sometimes people have two different possible things that they've thought of doing. Um, um, and like I said before, where you're motivated really to work on that uh, area um, and where you can demonstrate uh, your uh, research potential. So how are you going to do that? The same thing that Mark just said. So do re reach out to academics, either in your home institutions or, um, or potential supervisors here or elsewhere. Um, use the opportunity today. So outside this lecture theatre, you will be able to go and talk to our representatives of all our different research groups. So use that opportunity to go and talk to them, find out what's going on, um, who's in those research groups, uh, what they're working on, um, who's taking students, who isn't. Um, and, you know, just email people. Um, don't be too disheartened because people are very busy. Not everyone will respond immediately. Um, but I asked one of my uh, DFOR students about this, and when he was applying, he said he just emailed, he just sent out loads of emails to universities all across the UK, and he said he got about an 80% response rate, which is actually pretty good. So don't be too scared. If there's somebody you think, oh, that looks like an interesting person, I'd like to work with them then don't be scared to uh, drop them a line. And um, yeah, at the very least, find out if they're interested in taking students or not. But maybe, hopefully, um, find out a bit more than that. Um, um, so it's just some do's and don'ts, um, very general. So we don't really want to hear you know, about how you've loved mathematics since the age of three and you've received your first abacus, whatever. Um, what we're really looking for is some more detailed a description about what you want to work on and why you want to work on that area. And then really, if possible, evidence. So evidence that you've got the ability um, and the experience um, that will enable you to uh, do high-level research in that area. So what that evidence might consist, on, consist of, of course, is um, courses that you've done, your exam results, or if you've got particularly good exam results in particular areas. Um, if you've, um, if you've done any uh, reading, so if you might have read some papers, done some self-study to find out a bit more about what's going on in low-dimensional topology um, or whatever. Um, and if you have had the uh, opportunity uh, to do a, a research project or an internship or something like that, then again, we want to hear about all of those. So these are real, not just sort of saying, I love mathematics, but actual evidence to demonstrate that you, your commitment to it and your potential for doing research in your chosen area. So I think that's all I want to say. Um, I think I'm next passing on to Helen, who's going to talk about the interview process. Final, I think, bit of um, this session. So congratulations, you've been called to interview. What's going to happen next? Um, and I guess there's two bits to what I want to talk to you about. And, um, and again, hopefully this is to help you to prepare. 
and to think about when we're interviewing you, why are we interviewing? What is it that we want to learn about you? And the interview is structured in order that we can get some extra information above and beyond what you've written in your personal statement. So, and again, just to reassure you, your personal statement, your track record is all really, really good. So you should be feeling happy, right? Not, not anxious or anything. You've done really, really well. Not everyone is going to be called to interview, so be happy. Um, but think about why you're here. Why are we actually interviewing you and taking the time? And there are a number of different reasons. And I guess the first and probably one of the most important things is we want to get a feel for where your interests lie. Uh, why do you want to do a PhD? Why do you want to do a PhD in maths? Why, do you, why have you chosen a particular area? Why do you want to work with X? And this is where I think the homework that Mark was talking about earlier will really pay dividends, that you are able to talk about some of that. We don't expect you to be able to quote all of their publications and everything. That is not necessary. We're just trying to get a sense of what you're interested in and why, and, and why Oxford would be a good place for you to come and study. Um, obviously, we get a lot of applications. And you're all brilliant, obviously, um, but we will ask you some technical questions. And that's really, I guess, to sort of see, you know, that you live up to what you are on your piece of paper. And again, the idea here is really to try and see how you think. Um, hopefully, you know, in your personal statement, we won't be looking for asking you a really rogue question, or most people won't. Um, so if you say, I did this course and I thought it was fantastic and that's what's really motivated me to apply for a PhD, we might ask you a question about that course. So when you're writing your personal statement, just bear those things in mind. Don't talk about something that you found really, really difficult and you don't want anyone to ask you about. That's possibly not, well, it's a strategy, but I don't know, it's perhaps not the best strategy. Um, and I guess the other opportunity, the other sort of um, purpose of an interview is to potentially meet um, potential supervisors. Um, if you have um, sort of indicated people that you might like to work with on your in your personal statement, then you might expect perhaps one of those to be present at your interview. And again, they may ask you more detailed questions and talk. And again, that's an opportunity for you to ask them about what a research project would be like. And again, this goes back, again, do your homework. If you've already reached out to that person, they will remember your name. And it just means it sort of creates a really good impression of you as an individual if they've kind of, if you've already contacted them. OK, so that's kind of to give you an idea of why we like to call people for interview. And, and it is a really, really important um, part of the process. Um, so how do you prepare? And again, if you think about some of the purposes of the interview, what we as interviewers want to learn about you from the interview, hopefully that helps you to think about how you can best prepare. And there are some fairly obvious things here. You've written a personal statement. What did you say in that statement? Things that you have written in there are fair game to ask a question about, whether that be, I was inspired by Newton or whatever, and I've read his original sort of treaties, um, then someone might ask you about that. Uh, or whatever it might happen to be. I love such and such a course. Um, somebody's really inspired me. I watched a thing on the TV or whatever it might happen to be. Um, those would be all fair things to ask you about. So make sure you go back, read your personal statement, think about what questions might be embedded within what you've written, and make sure you've got a few words that you can say in answer to those sorts of questions. A natural thing to talk about or to ask you to talk about would be any research projects that you might have done. And that might be as part of your sort of degree program, or maybe you've done an internship, um, a summer project, whatever it might happen to be. Make sure that you are comfortable to tell somebody just for a few minutes about that project. And in particular, 
were what sort of equations were you dealing, what sort of maths, uh, what did you do, what did you learn, what did you enjoy. Um, and again, then you may have a discussion that may sort of promote a sort of further questions based on the, the work that you've done there. Um, again, as I've said, if you've been, maybe an examiner might say, what courses are you doing at the moment, right? And again, you can think, choose courses that you like, right? Because they might ask you a question about one of them. Make sure you're on top of those courses. It doesn't have to be an exhaustive list of everything, but a few that you really, really like and that you're good at, I would hope. And I guess, yeah, the final important thing is, it can feel very intimidating coming into an interview and having to talk about mathematics. Um, certainly when I was younger, I, I found it very, very difficult. I was okay if you gave me a piece of paper and asked me to do a calculation, but actually talking about it can feel quite nerve wracking. But just remember, you've been called to interview. You're good. You deserve to be there. So use that to try and relax. Um, it, it should be um, an enjoyable, ish experience um, to learn something about yourself to just show off just how good you are and how much you deserve to be studying for a PhD and I think that's all that I would like to say I hope that's helpful welcome to the part of the program on master's courses at Oxford uh, I'm the Director of Graduate Studies in charge of the teaching side of, of graduate life. So that includes um, all of the, the master's courses. My name's Mark Lackenby. Um, I'm also a topologist and a, a geometer. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too long on this. I'm gonna mostly hand over to the various course directors who run our different master's programs. Just wanna say a few short words. Um, first of all, what master's courses do we offer? Well, <clears throat> we're particularly proud of our master's courses at Oxford. We have roughly 200 students per year come to Oxford um, to study them, um, and there are five of them. So um, there's the master's in mathematical sciences, um, which um, runs parallel with our fourth year of our undergraduate course, it's an extensive program of courses um, across mathematics. Um, and then there are um, somewhat more uh, focused courses. So there's the MSc in Mathematical Modeling and Scientific Computing. Um, there's the math MSc in uh, Mathematics and Computational Finance. Um, there's a, a, a joint MSc with um, the Department of Computer Science, which is uh, in mathematics and the foundations of computer science. And there's an MSc in uh, mathematics and theoretical physics, which is run jointly with the physics department. So the various course directors are gonna tell you about each of those shortly, but mostly what I want to tell you about is um, what funding opportunities there are for our master's programs. So master's programs uh, for, uh, uh, if you're a home student, you are eligible for um, uh, student loans, um, just in the same way that uh, an undergraduate would be. Um, but there are various uh, specific scholarships that we offer, some of which are new, and uh, um, which are targeted scholarships, um, which we are very excited about. And here they are, there's the uh, Optiva Foundation scholarships, the James Street Graduate Scholarships, and the Martingale Foundation um, postgraduate scholarships. So the Optiva Foundation scholarships, um, these are available to female applicants from low and middle income countries. Um, and um, uh, a scholarship covers the cost of any master's course um, in the Maths Institute, with the exception of um, the mathematical and computational finance. Um, there's no need to make a separate application for, for that particular uh, scholarship. Um, when you apply for one of these courses, you will automatically be considered for the scholarship if you're eligible for it. 
But nevertheless, it's worth highlighting that uh, these are uh, very nice scholarships. And if you are eligible for them, then I do encourage you to uh, put in an application uh, for that relevant master's program. And you can find more information on that scholarship um, on um, uh, uh, the uh, fees and funding pages of uh, the Oxford University website. Um, there's the Jane Street Graduate Scholarships. So these are four fully funded scholarships. Um, they're available to uh, UK students who are black or mixed black. Um, and um, again, no separate application is required. But again, I'd like to uh, flag these up. They are um, some of our flagship scholarships and um, uh, they, are, uh, they completely cover the cost of a master's course. So again, I would encourage you to put an application to one of those courses if you're uh, eligible for this scholarship. And then there's um, <clears throat> the Martingale Foundation scholarships. So these are a bit different. Um, and um, so this year, that they're, they're brand new this year. Um, they're only available to people applying for OMS, the Masters in Mathematical Sciences. Um, and uh, they are, uh, uh, applications are, uh, are welcome from any candidate, but um, from any background, but especially for those for whom family income has been or would be a barrier to postgraduate education. And you have to have home fee status to be eligible for this. What's unusual about this is that this scholarship is that these are, there are five of these scholarships and they cover um, both masters and DPhil. If you get one of these, you get funding for both a masters and a DPhil. So initially you go into the masters program and then you then apply for a DPhil place, but you apply with the knowledge that you have funding for that. So they're uh, very attractive scholarships. And this is the crucial bit in red. So a separate application has to be made for those. Then what happens is they make the funding decisions and then you then apply to the relevant master's course with the knowledge that you have funding for that course and for the DPhil afterwards. You have to make the application via the Martingale Foundation. You don't do it via the Maths Institute website. It's not part of the Univer Oxford University portal. And more inf information is on their website. So we're very excited about these scholarships. It's great to be partnering with the Martingale Foundation. 